Hello, Internet. We're live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 19 of the Stanford MO Sys seminar series. Uh, I'm Karan. We have, as always, Piero, Dan, Fyodor, and Matei, and our guest today, Amit Tawakar from um, CMU. So we're going to be chatting with Amit about transferring neural architectures on, on new tasks and um, Amit has a pretty MLSYS background. He's like, I would say the epitome of MLSYS. He's the president of the MLSYS board. Um, he helped create the MLSYS conference, served as inaugural program chair in 2018, general chair in 2019. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the ML department at CMU, and he is also a co-founder and chief scientist of Determined AI um, and works on statistical machine learning and topics around that uh, related to fairness, interpretability, federated learning, a uh, lot of stuff. Um, so today we're very excited to have you, uh, Amin. And as always, like we're gonna have Amin give a 30 minute talk followed by a 30 minute podcast style discussion where you can ask um, questions and, and post questions in chat um, and keep those questions coming during the talk as well. We'll keep track of them and get them across to Amin um, at the end of the talk. So Amin, take it away. Cool. Thank, uh, thank you guys so much for having me. It's really exciting. And I've been following the, uh, this uh, talk series and it's been really well received and it's really cool to be, to be part of it. Um, and especially nice to be here on April 1st, you know, uh, April Fool's Day. I will keep the talk mostly factual. There is one incorrect statement that I make in the talk that we can, hopefully someone will, will figure it out later. But uh, right, so today I'm talking about automated architecture transfer on diverse tasks. Uh, but to start, I want to step back a little bit. Uh, I've been, you know, I, I've been using an analogy to aviation for the last few years to both motivate my work, but also talk about MLSYS, I think, more generally. Uh, and I think it's particularly appropriate both for, you know, for this venue, but also for the, the work I'm going to be talking about today. So this is a picture of the uh, Wright brothers in 1903. This is their seminal flight in, uh, in Kitty Hawk. It was pretty modest in absolute terms. They, you know, they flew for tens of seconds, hundreds of meters. But it, you know, it launched the pioneer age of uh, aviation. It showed that powered flight was really a possibility. And it led them and others to keep pushing on this technology to the point that just a few, few years later, it was culturally accepted that powered flight would really revolutionize our society, right? So uh, the, Wright, the Wright brothers went to the World's Fair and they demoed all the amazing things that they could do. I think they got a little bit ahead of themselves. They, I believe they started a company in aviation around the 1910s that you know, they were, they were ahead of their time. And that's largely because for a really long time, aviation in practice was restricted to a small group of people, to the elites and to the military, right? It was really, it played a big role in World War I and World War II, but the commercial jet age, people like you and me actually flying, it took four decades after the World's Fair before, you know, the, this commercial jet age commenced, right? And in order to really democratize aviation, we needed to invent this field of aeronautical engineering. Right? We needed to come up with turbine engines that were powerful enough and efficient enough to allow us to fly around the country, around the world. We needed to come up with ways to automate the, you know, the building of planes and the testing of planes. And of course, safety was an underlying concern before civilians were able to fly. Right? We needed to stress test the, the planes themselves. We needed to come up with things like the FAA and other regulatory agencies to make sure it was really safe to do this in a, in a widespread fashion. And so why am I talking about all of this in the context of ML? Well, I'd argue that you know, we're still in the pioneer age of machine learning, right? You could argue that 2012, the success of ImageNet was sort of impossible to ignore. There were amazing, you know, it was kind of an amazing result. Uh, it was something that you know, people tried to ignore, people who were not historically in, in the deep learning camp, but it was kind of an impossible result to ignore because it was, it was so impressive. Where we are today is that machine learning really is culturally accepted as something that's gonna revolutionize society. Um, we're already seeing some evidence of that but it's very, very much restricted. Uh, and right, we have a lot of work to do to get to the so-called jet age of machine learning. And to a large extent, I feel that the field of ML sys is sort of like the field of aeronautical engineering for aviation. We need to fundamentally you know, study these problems of efficiency, automation, and safety to allow a wider group of people and organizations to actually use ML efficiently in an automated fashion and to do it safely. Uh, and so what I'm gonna be talking about mostly today is some of my work in the context of automation, and at the end, I'll briefly talk uh, about some some new directions in safety. Um, but right, so you know, with, with that intro, let's go back to to ImageNet and you know think about what drove progress in computer vision in the 2010s. 
And so this is a plot that I'm sure that most of you, or some version of this is something that you guys have all seen before, right? So starting with 2012, this is AlexNet when it came out and it absolutely crushed previous best performance on this ImageNet benchmark. Uh, the benchmark had been sort of stagnating and all of a sudden, you know, this, this deep neural network just came at, you know, just dominated uh, what, what existed before. And in the next, you know, the next few years, we continually march towards increasing progress to the point that by 2016, or maybe a little earlier, depending on how you're counting, uh, we were, you know, we were beating human performance on this very challenging uh, uh, computer vision task. So kind of what was underlying this progress, All right? So in the first half of the 2010s, it was largely hand designed convolutional architectures, right? So this is a picture of uh, Google Net, where it consists of a bunch of different nodes of this inception module, at least to me, it looks really complicated. It's not at all clear exactly why this is the right architecture to be using. And it's, it's something that researchers spend a lot of time fiddling with to, to get these sorts of architectures uh, to work and to do really well on these tasks. And the sorts of things that they fiddled with were you know, figuring out repeated block structures and how to connect the different blocks. So there was inception V1, V2, V3, where they fiddled with the, you know, with, with the different components of the cell blocks. They were you know, coming up with normalization and things like batch norm. They were co-designing, there were ideas, you know, co-designing these architectures to work well with emerging optimizers, things like Atom. Uh, there was coming up with things like skip, neck, skip connections, which led to you know, ResNets. And then, yeah, there was, there was you know, fiddling with the cell block design itself. What size should your convolution be? Uh, what kind of pooling should you use? And so on, right? And so with these sorts of knobs that, that could be tuned and, with, and seeing both the progress with hand-designed convolutional architectures as well as the work required to make progress here, this sort of you know, led to, to additional work to keep pushing in maybe a more automated fashion. It led to this, this field of neural architecture search, which largely focused still on image tasks, but tried to do it in a little bit more of an automated way, focusing on cell block design and how to automate and fine tune these cell blocks to further push performance. Okay, so that's to a large extent, or that's, a, that's a very uh, sweeping overview of what happened in the 2010s. But we're now in 2021. So there's a question of, in the context of computer vision, how important are new convolutional architectures today? And you know that's, that's a hard question to answer. And, and on one hand, if you're in a setting where you're, you're constrained in some way, you have a multi-objective setting where you want your models to run on some edge device on your cell phone, and you have, you know, you have latency considerations, you have energy considerations, then coming up with new architectures that are both accurate and efficient based on whatever systems constraints you have, is certainly a really active area, an active problem, one where there's a lot of work left to do. But you know, if you're working on a fairly standard computer vision problem, uh, and you're focused largely on some sort of accuracy, you know, as you can kind of see in this plot, we're we're plateauing a little bit. Sure, there's more work to be to be done, but it's not clear that that's the most important problem to be working on right now, given the amazing architectures that have been developed over the 2000 the 2010s. There's Still, though, a question of how do these convolutional architectures transfer to non-vision domains? And here is where things get a little dicier, right? If you're working in a domain that looks a lot like standard computer vision problems, then you're probably okay. The further away you get from these sorts of domains, the less clear it is that, that existing you know, convolutional architectures or pre-trained versions of them will actually work uh, on your domain of interest, right? And what you often see is that practitioners, it's kind of they have a problem, they're, they, they're gonna go to, to you know, torch vision or hugging face and grab the model that they're able to find and use it for their particular problem. But it's often you know, square peg round hole, right? It's not necessarily the right architecture for their problem, it's just what they have available to them. And we've seen this already in the context of you know, additional human innovations, uh, human led innovations in, in, in terms of architectures, right? So in the context of sequence modeling, convolutions and convolutional neural networks are okay, if you use you know, convolutions with large dilations, but transformers are a lot better. For predictions on graphs, regular convolutions don't really even make sense. Graph convolutions are a lot better. And for, you know, for more, uh, you know, uh, more abstract or exotic applications like you know, neural uh, PDE solvers, convolutions again work, po work poorly. Uh, and then, you know, in citing recent work that's going to appear in iClear, not, not our work, but by others, that's going to appear in iClear uh, in, in a few months, people have developed new operations that lead to state-of-the-art uh, <clears throat> neural PDE solvers, okay? You can still argue that, you know, now we have convolutional architectures, we have all of these other architectures that people have designed, and in particular, transformers are, you know, 
all the rage right now, maybe we're still okay, right? And in some sense, you could argue that that's true, right? So for lots of the applications that we hear about today, the, the really exciting applications, autonomous vehicles are largely computer vision-based applications or deep learning is often used there a lot. Uh, for voice assistants or voice powered uh, interfaces, transformers are a natural thing to be doing or, or a natural set of architectures to be using. And of course, right, no talk would be complete without a, uh, you know, without a, an iceberg slide. So, but, you know, even though there are these really, uh, you know, standard applications where transformers and CNNs make a lot of sense, there's this really, really heavy tail of applications and domains where machine learning either could be used or we don't even know if it could be used. But kind of going back to the point I made earlier, we're in this pioneer age. It's not a mature field yet. We don't know exactly all the things we could do with machine learning. Uh, you know, and for every application and domain where machine learning is being used today, there's the hope and the promise that there could be orders of magnitude more of them in the future. And so I'd argue it's a little short-sighted to say that the set of hand-crafted architectures, whether they're convolutions or transformers, are going to cover the wide range of diverse applications that both we know about today, and, and but also ones we don't even know about yet, right? And you know, and, and to be clear, this is the kind of the, the, the broad problem that I'm interested in solving, which is not let's, you know, the focus is not let's look at more computer vision applications and come up with better architectures there. That's a problem that we've made huge progress on in the 2010s. And it's not say, let's look at NLP or, you know, text-based uh, problems, right? Transformers are doing amazingly well there. It's this heavy tail of, of diverse applications that are probably, that are, we don't, don't even know exist yet, or even if we do know they they exist, they're they're, they're much less studied and possibly not uh, you know well well uh, positioned to take advantage of CNNs or, or things like transformers, right? So how do we go about solving this problem? This coming up with architectures that work well uh, or, or models that work well on this diverse set of uh, of, of exotic tasks. Uh, and so I think to answer that question, one high level observation to make is to kind of look back at what people did in the past for developing these new non-convolutional architectures for applications like sequence modeling, predictions on graphs, and solving PDEs. And I'd argue that one common thread in all of these uh, lines of work is that you know, they did something that I'm calling architecture transfer, which is that their focus was not on innovating on the backbones or the topology of the underlying architectures that they wanted to use. It was instead focusing on designing new operations. So self-attention for sequence modeling, graph convolutions for graphs, and this Fourier neural operation for solving PDEs, right? And so the question that I want to ask, and the broad question I want that, that that we've been studying is, how can we automate this process? Right? There was a lot of time and effort to, right? And there was an iClear paper just on this PDE, uh, you know, this this PDE work that that I'll talk more about later. Obviously, transformers are, are getting a lot of attention right now, but it's a lot of of expert handcrafted effort required to design each of these new operations for for new tasks. Can we automate this architecture transfer uh, process for a diverse set of tasks? So that's what I want to talk about next. And in particular, I want to talk about some recent work uh, and ongoing work that, uh, that we're doing in, in, in this direction. And so this is work with uh, my students, Misha and Nick, as well as with some folks at Stanford, Tree and Chris, uh, as well as with a former student, uh, Liam Lee. Okay, so right, what, what is the, the broad goal of what we're trying to do? Right? We're trying to learn task specific per edge neural operations, right? And so we have a fixed backbone. So here I'm showing this very simplified fixed backbone. And you know, we wanna learn an operation on each edge. What I'm showing in this picture is just the operation uh, that goes between edge two and four, but we wanna learn a similar operation for, for different edges as well. And so the, real, you know, the question is what operations should we consider, right? And maybe you know, a first approach would be to use the discrete set of existing operations that we know about, right? The operations that we know work well for, say, vision applications, whether you know, convolutions, pooling, identity operations. Maybe we can also throw in operations that have more recently been tailored for other domains, self-attention, uh, you know, FNO, whatever else. The problem with that approach is that you know, fundamentally we're not discovering new operations if we're just reusing the existing operations that have been handcrafted with you know, with, with a priori knowledge about other domains. What we instead need is a much more general and expressive space of operations so that we can hopefully discover and learn new operations for, for these new tasks. And so what we've been developing in our work is the space of operations, which we call XD operations. 
So this is a, a continuous space of operations that contains several named operations. And what I mean by that, it, you know, it contains operations that you've heard of. So for instance, uh, most of the standard operations that people use in, in convolutional neural networks. So convolutions, various types of dilated convolutions, average pooling, identity. Uh, it doesn't, in, one thing it doesn't include is, uh, to, to be clear, is, is max pooling. Um, but it also includes a bunch of other operations. So this FNO operation, uh, graph convolutions for fixed adjacency matrices, but it also includes an infinite other, you know, it's a, it's a continuous space. So it includes a, you know, a, an infinite number of, of other uh, operations as well. In addition, these XD operations, the, the, uh, the operations in the space are parameterized uh, via architectural parameters that we can learn via gradient descent. And so we'll talk more about how to actually use these XD operations. Uh, but first, I kind of want to tell you a little bit more about where they come from and how we, how we construct them in the first place. Right. And so, so far, I've been sort of saying, hey, we need to move beyond convolutions. Convolutions aren't enough. That said, they do serve as a really nice starting point for us to construct this broader family of operations that we're calling XD operations. And right, the, the observations we make is that the, the common operations used in computer vision, convolutions, dilated convolutions, identity operations, zero, op zero operations, average pooling, basically everything that you, you typically see, say, other than max pooling, can be viewed as some sort of convolution, right? Some of them are kind of, you know, simple edge cases, but they're all, they're all a convolution of some sort. And, these, and convolutions have some nice properties. So one nice property is that they're linear operations. So if I take, uh, right, if, I, if, if, I, if I have a convolution with a set of filter weights W and I have some input, so let's say I have an image, 100 by 100 image, and I vector, I stretch it out, so I, you know, I vectorize it, then I can express that convolution operation with that specific set of filters as a matrix, ma matrix vector multiplied. And so this matrix AW is the linear operator uh, corresponding to, uh, to, to that convolution. All right, so convolutions are linear. Moreover, this, this, matrix, this, this matrix AW can be diagonalized by the discrete Fourier transform. And this is nice because DFTs can be represented, that they're efficient. They can be represented and applied in n log n bits and time. Okay, so what have I done so far? I've done very little. I basically said that lots of different operations are convolutions. That was the last slide. And then I said, okay, convolutions have these two nice properties. But right, these are properties that you know, are kind of well-known and well-established about convolutions. But the reason I've gotten to this point is that this is the launching point for which we can now generalize this, uh, this particular expression for convolutions into a more expressive space of operations. And in particular, the key idea is, can we replace DFTs, which are these, is an efficient structured matrix by a more general family of efficient structured matrices? And, you know, why might we want to do that? Well, that, you know, that generally that's a strategy that we take for this XD operation approach. So we replace the F here, which is the DFT and the F inverse, which is the inverse of the DFT with these three matrices, K, L, and M, which we say are living are part of some family of efficient matrices. You know, there's the open question of what efficient matrices do we use? I'll get to that in a second. But the point is by generalizing the construction going from convolution to this more general construction, we get this more general family of operations called XD operations, which have architecture parameters, which are precisely these three matrices, K, L, and M. Um, and right, so that, that, that's the construction. I'll explain in a little bit why this is a useful thing to do. But to complete the construction, the next question or the last question to answer is, what are these matrices K, L, and M, right? So what family of efficient matrices should we be using? And for that, we, you know, we, we leverage work coming out of Stanford by Tree, Chris, and others uh, over the last few years uh, of, of matrices called kaleidoscope matrices. And right, so you know, we're, we're really building on this work. And I imagine there's several people uh, listening on this talk who are, you know, uh, who are more of an expert in kind of the details of these kaleidoscope matrices. And I'm, you know, for, for the sake of this talk, all we need to know is that these are FFT-like uh, matrices that are products of small factor matrices. And crucially, they are able to efficiently express any matrix that can efficiently perform uh, matrix vector multiplies, right? So they're basically they're a generalization of DFT that can also express permutations or sparse matrices or low rank matrices and so on, right? So they're basically, they're a generalization of, of DFTs is, is one way to think about it. And so why is this a useful thing to do? 
Well, basically what we do again in a nutshell is we start with this uh, representation for convolutions and we replace the DFT with these K matrices, both to preserve efficiency. So these asymptotically, the representation cost and the cost to do matrix multiplies is the same for the DFT as it is for K matrices. So from an efficiency point of view, at least asymptotically, we don't lose anything. In practice, we are slightly, you know, we're doing slightly more work, the constants are larger, but efficiency wise, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's a, a, a reasonable thing to do. And we're, we're, paying, we're taking, a, we, we lose nothing asymptotically in terms of efficiency. We use a, lose a little bit in practice, but at the benefit of having many, many more operations that we can express, right? So of course we can express convolutions. If we define K, L and M to be F, we recover a convolution as you'd expect, but we can also get all of these other operations as well. Okay, so that's you know that's where we get this XD this this uh, this uh, family of XD operations. The next question is how would you use them, right? So we've talked about this pretty abstractly. How would this work, right? So again, I was motivating this problem by saying you're coming, you're an ML practitioner, you're starting with a new exotic application. What you would typically do is you know even though you have a square peg. You're going to try to fit it in, into a round hole because you know you have your data, you have access via Torch Vision to a pre-trained ResNet model, and that's what you're going to use, right? So you have this pre-trained ResNet model. Maybe you're going to you know fine tune it or train it using SGD or Atom, and then you're going to evaluate it and tune it as needed. So that's what you would do before. And I'd argue that the more unlike a computer vision model your problem, uh, the more removed your application is from a standard computer vision task. The less, uh, the less good of a fit a ResNet might be. And so, right, that's kind of the motivation in the first place. How would, how would you potentially use an XD operation instead of using a vanilla ResNet? Well, so the first thing you would do is you, you would keep the topology, you keep the backbone of the ResNet, you would just replace every convolution in that ResNet with this XD operation, right? So that's step one. Now, what do you need to do? Now you need to use your data to, to, to learn. You know, so for a ResNet, the, the architecture is fixed and all you're doing is learning the model weights. So you're learning the filter weights and you're learning any other weights for the non-convolutional layers. But now, instead of using a ResNet, you're using this XD operation, uh, you know, XD operation plus ResNet backbone model. And so there's two sets of things you need to learn. You need to learn the model weights, but you also need to learn the architecture weights to specify which XD operation you're using for this particular architecture. And so, all that means though in practice is that you're not gonna simultaneously train your model weights and your architecture parameters, again, using say SGD or Atom. And then finally, you're, you know, you're gonna tune as usual. The only extra tuning involved in the context of using XD operations with a ResNet or some convolutional backbone versus using a ResNet itself is that you have to tune you know, additional hyperparameters associated with the optimizer you're using for, for the architecture parameters themselves. Okay. Uh, and you know, in a second, I'll get to experimental results. Okay, in a second, I'll get to experimental results. Uh, but before doing that, I wanted to talk very briefly about how this relates to neural architecture search. Right, this was kind of, you know, motivation for our work initially was thinking about what we thought was working in neural architecture search, and also what we might want to be doing differently. And kind of a key thing that we wanted to do differently was to focus on different tasks, not focus on computer vision, not focus on tasks that are already very, very well studied. We wanted to st study tasks that we think are understudied and where we could really you know, go from zero to one in terms of, of getting machine learning to be used. Um, and so a big difference here is the, the size of a search space. If you're thinking about this as a NOS problem, right? Instead of working with a discrete set of you know, eight-ish operations, we have this uh, continuous search space, which includes a bunch of named operations and many, many more. That said, we are leveraging some aspects of neural architecture search in particular, we're kind of, we're leveraging the weight sharing paradigm where we're kind of jointly learning architecture parameters and model parameters, right? And again, if, if you're not familiar with neural architecture search, that might not be much to you and that's okay, but there's a family of continuous relaxation neural architecture search methods that use weight sharing to simultaneously learn architecture weights and model weights. And we do something similarly. Now, a big difference, and this is where I think we're blurring the line between whether this is actually neural architecture search we're just proposing a new model family, is that our training process says, you know, simultaneously learn model weights and architecture weights. Once you're done training, you're done, use that model. Whereas in neural architecture search, what you often do is 
you're you know you do whatever you need to do to learn an architecture and then given that architecture you train it from scratch in a separate sort of fashion and so Ultimately, I would argue it doesn't really matter. What really matters is the problem that we're trying to solve and we're solving this architecture transfer problem. And I think that's an important problem to solve. Whether you think that this is a neural architecture search problem or not, it's, it's, it sort of is, it sort of isn't. Uh, I think it's worth connecting to it and, and stating similarities and differences, but it's not clear to me that it actually is a neural architecture search problem. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about uh, you know, how this is working in practice. Uh, in, in a paper that we archived just recently, I think we have, uh, three or four different uh, experiment sets of experimental results. I'm just going to show you two of them here. Uh, first one is a little bit of a toy experiment, and it's it's a permuted Safar 10 data set. So, and it's amazing to me that that models can predict anything on Safar 10, just because these images are just so so blurry and hard to see. But the permuted ones, where we basically just take the rows and columns and just permute them, are right sort of really really hard to. It, it's clear that convolutions are, are not the right op operation after you do this permutation. In fact, the right operation in some sense is doing an unpermutation followed by a convolution. Uh, and it turns out that that operation is within you know, the family of, of XD operations. And so what we wanted to evaluate, right? we're gonna evaluate on Safar 10 and then on the perm permuted version of it. So first we evaluate on Safar 10, in some sense to be backwards compatible. right? To be very clear, the motivation of this work is, is absolutely not to improve in computer vision. Precisely to do the opposite of that, right? It's to improve in, in domains that are precisely not computer vision. That said, being backwards compatible, if we have this new set of operations that are generalizing convolutions, you would expect it to also do reasonably well in settings where we know convolutions work well, namely you know, on, on Safar 10. And so in this experiment, we're, we're fixing two different backbones, LANET, which is a small you know, classical neural network, and then ResNet 20, which is a slightly more modern one. And we're comparing with three variants of this. One is just the traditional convolutional LANET or ResNet. The second is the XD operation where we swap out all the convolutions with XD operations. The third one is, is from the neural architecture search community where we're starting with the, the eight specific, you know, the eight discrete operations that they use and learning a supernet where we learn a linear combination over those operations. And that's, again, that's a very NOS specific thing. That's a, a standard thing to do in NOS. And what do we see? Well, the, the point of this first plot is to show that we're, we are backwards compatible. We do, right, the goal again is not to do better than these other methods on traditional computer vision tasks, but to verify we're not significantly worse. And these results clearly show we're not significantly worse with XD operations than with, than with prior art. All right, so now having established that, we can see what happens when we look at permuted Safar 10. And what we see here is that we get a huge win uh, using XD operations, right? We get 15% improvement, uh, and you know, XD operations we see dramatically outperform both convolutions uh, and the darts relaxation on this permuted Safar 10 setup. It's not surprising that CNNs and the darts relaxations perform badly because the set of operations that they're using are not well suited for this permuted task. What is cool is that the XD operation is able to, uh, you know, is is robust to that permutation and to be able to do significantly better. Okay, cool. So that's one application. The next application is, is, is uh, this neural PDE solver, right? And so we mentioned this earlier before. Uh, there's, you know, this is, you know, there's recent work coming up at iClear where uh, people have used, uh, the, the people introduced a uh, Fourier neural operation, which in some sense takes a very standard backbone, replaces convolutions with this FNO operation, and it leads to, you know, really nice results. And and the the, the setup here is a little, is worth mentioning here, which is that, Traditional PDE solvers are well studied, but they can be slow, especially at high resolutions. And for the particular benchmarks that we're using, which are exactly following uh, the ben you know, just using the same benchmarks as in the Cycler paper, the traditional solvers in terms of their final results are good. They produce good solutions, they just do it slowly. And so the idea here is there's a, for the, for the, the neural PDE solvers, there's training time and test time. At training time, we actually generate data that maps from the inputs, which are initial conditions, and you know, and maps from these inputs to a solution. And the way we generate this training data is actually using traditional PDE solvers. So generating this data is expensive in the first place because we're using these slow traditional PDE solvers. But the question is, can we use this training data along with neural networks to learn this mapping 
such that for new instantiations of this problem with different initial conditions, can we do, can we match the solution performance or solution quality of traditional solvers, but do so more quickly, right? And in particular, can we do it orders of magnitude more quickly? And what this paper showed was that yes, with this FNO, uh, with this FNO operator for the particular set of benchmarks that they considered, they were able to get, you know, I think they're early results, but promising results to show that this is a, an interesting uh, step forward. And so what we wanna do is we, you know, we looked at the same three benchmarks. Uh, we're comparing the, you know, same step, same setup as before. We have, a, we have a fixed backbone and that backbone can either be all convolutional, which is a CNN. It can be the CNN replaced with FNO, which is what they did in their paper or we can use XD operations and learn the right operation along with the weights. And what we found is that, uh, you know, CNNs, their performance degrades, especially as you get to higher resolutions, but kind of remarkably, XD operations slightly outperform this FNO operation. Um, it's, it, again, it's worth noting that the, the family of XD operations contains both convolutions and FNO, but we're, we're learning the operation from the data itself. And you know, we're particularly excited about this result because this is sort of an example of, right, at this point, someone has done all the work to learn this FNO operation, but they did that because a classical CNN wasn't very good here. And what we were able to do was come up with a general purpose search space. And in fact, we only discovered this application and the fact that FNOs were within this family after we were well through the, the formulation of, of the XD search space itself. Uh, and so was, you know, we were not expecting to even come close to, you know matching necessarily a hand-designed operator for a particular task, and we're kind of pleasantly surprised by this result. Uh, this is you know, a similar result for uh, a different PDE uh, included in their benchmark, and the results are the same for all three of the benchmarks that we looked at uh, following their paper. Uh, so I should be clear just to, to follow up, there are a bunch of open questions still, right? This is early work. Uh, speed is still an issue, right? The, the, the reason we introduce XD operations over convolutions is for expressivity. But there's still, and you know, and we're we're within an order of magnitude in terms of speed right now for relative to CNNs. But there's a question of can we be more efficient or can we leverage some sorts of approximations to further improve efficiency? Uh, there's questions of how do we appropriately warm start XD operations, right? So these XD operations include a bunch of named operations. And there's a question of should we initialize the architecture parameters to say be convolutions or FNOs or, or something else? We already are doing this in a somewhat ad hoc fashion right now. We're seeing uh, you know, benefits of that, but it's worth studying more. There's also questions about expressivity, right? XD operations aren't the only way to solve this automated architecture transfer problem. They currently don't consider things like uh, graph convolutions for dynamic graphs or self-attention, both of which are things that are important. And beyond that, you know, there, there's more evaluation to do, to do to see how well this actually works in general on a more diverse set of tests. Um, Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say about uh, uh, neural architecture transfer and XD operations. I wanted to conclude by zooming back and talking a little bit about uh, some other work, and this is just a few slides, so I'll be done in, in a few minutes. Um, but I wanna talk about uh, more recent work and ideas that we have in the context of uh, safety. Uh, and in particular, right, my group has been thinking a lot about interpretable machine learning recently. And I think, you know, more generally, I think that the field of MLSYS is really we need to figure out how we can be part of this discussion about making machine learning safe. If we're building the systems for machine learning, it's not enough just to optimize for accuracy or to train models and serve models efficiently. We need to make sure that you know, people who are using them, that the guardrails are there in place such that people are using them safely. Uh, and I view interpretable ML potentially as a lens to help, you know, help ML developers as they're creating their models debug and understand you know, the safety or identify risks in the models that they're creating. That said, you know, there's, there's a bunch of ways people talk about interpretable ML in terms of what it can be useful for, right? So you know, that, that, the, the broad application I talked about just now is, can ML engineers inspect their models to verify accuracy, fairness, privacy, other sort of safety, potential safety concerns? Potentially you can use interpretable ML or explainable ML to model decisions and provide recourse for end users. So, Let's say you know you're, you you applied for a loan and a model predicted made a prediction so that you get you got denied a loan. What recourse do you have as a user who was denied that loan? There's also the very vague notion of interpretable ML to somehow quote unquote elicit or, uh, to harbor trust with people using the model. I don't think that's a very well specified uh, problem, but it's something that people talk about a lot. So 
the reason I'm bringing this up is just more to say that I think this is a broad set of open problems. Right now with interpretable ML, there's no single definition, even among social scientists. As I talked about on the last slide, there's different goals for different settings. There's a bunch of different explanation types and you know, machine learning models that people have come up with to solve abstracted problems that may or may not correspond to practical problems people care about. Evaluation of all of these methods is sort of a mess right now. Um, so there's a lot of problems to solve, but I would argue this is also a real opportunity for the field to, you know, to come up with the new definitions, the new methods, the right ways to do evaluations, to come up with a foundational theory, to find the grounding applications to do evaluations the right way. Uh, and then, you know, this is something my group has been thinking about a lot. We, uh, we published, uh, published, we archived a white paper uh, just a week or two ago, kind of uh, summarizing our take on the field of interpretable ML, as well as what we think some of the core challenges are to ground the field in real applications. Uh, so if you're interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, and with that, I will uh, conclude uh, just a few things. You know, the, the papers that I mentioned, the XD operation paper and the interpretable white paper, you can check out my website to find more. Uh, I want to thank again my co-authors who did all the hard work, especially Misha and Nick, uh, students who, who, who led this XD work. And then quickly, I just wanted to give a shout out for uh, the MLSYS conference, uh, which is starting next week. You can still register online. It's uh, for students especially, very cheap. We'd love to, you know, there, there's some incredible invited speakers and 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 uh, and contributed talks by the by the published papers. There's a uh, there, you know, there's there's workshops afterwards. There's a a hardware uh, day before the main conference starts. So there's a full week of really interesting talks and events. Uh, so you can check out more on on the website. All right, with that, I'll conclude. Uh, thanks for, for for listening. Oh, and I guess if people figured out what was uh, the incorrect statement that I made, I'd, I'd be curious. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Thanks so much for talking to me. And uh, yeah, just a reminder to folks in, uh, in the audience, you can uh, post your questions in chat and we'll, um, we'll look over them and, and get them across to me. So I guess to kick things off, now I'm, now I'm only thinking about what was wrong in the talk. <laughs> You've thrown me, me off balance there. But yeah, I, I was curious about the, uh, uh, like you talked about the space of operations, right? Um, I'm curious how easy it is to um, arrive at the right answer within that space. So I think the uh, the CIFAR experiment was pretty interesting because like, as you pointed out, like uh, the right answer might've been just unpermuting and then uh, doing convolution um, after that. But I, I think I noticed that the numbers that you get with, with XD are actually, there's a gap between what you yeah. get on CIFAR and per permuted CIFAR. So I'm curious, like, is that because uh, what gets learned isn't an unpermutation plus some convolution. Is that yeah. to how easy it is to learn that space of operations? And yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I guess I'd say a few things here. Yeah. So one, certainly there. If if we had, I don't think we did this, but I think it's uh, I think it's just trivially true. Had we used an unpermutation followed by a convolution for that problem, we should have recovered exactly the same numbers as Safar ten. And those were like in the 90s, whereas what we were, or there was definitely a gap between the XD results for permuted and, you know, all of the results for unpermuted. So it's not like we, we exactly recovered the right operation. Um, I guess I'd say two things. One, uh, yeah, the, the, there is a question, and this, I think this is related to how to say warm start or how do you, how do you add, you know, uh, how do you encode the right domain knowledge into how to warm start this or how to help guide the search or the learning process of the architectures. We found that warm starting with the architecture parameters and coding a convolution often work really, works really well. But in some sense, that doesn't seem like the right, like I think my students and I sort of disagree on this, but I don't think that doesn't make sense to me that it's the right thing. If, if the whole argument of what we're making is that convolutions aren't always the right operation, then warm starting with convolutions shouldn't be the best you can do. But warm starting with convolutions is a lot better than warm starting random or than not warm starting. So, right, there are questions that maybe we can use unsupervised data or weak supervision or meta learn to learn better initializations to make it easier to learn sort of the right things. So that's one answer. And again, I don't have the answers there, but I think there's work to do there. The other thing I would say though is that we did, I didn't include this in the talk, but we uh, we did want we did want to get some sense of what like what operation is learned at all, right? And so one way to do that, and it's not perfect, but it's 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 a metric that gives you something, is 
right? So all of these operations correspond to some linear operation, right? They're all linear operations. So you can just compare the two matrices that are learned, right? The, the, right. You can compare these two matrices that are learned. And basically we had this like relative Frobenius distance metric that we looked at. And one thing that we found was that the relative, that the relative distance between a convolution and the XD op for Safar 10 was much, much smaller than that distance for per permuted Safar 10. So in some sense, it's saying that like the XD operation learns something that looks much more like a convolution in Safar 10 than it does for permuted Safar 10, which kind of makes sense because permutation doesn't do very well. But th these are all very hand wavy. I, I, and I don't, yeah, I don't have answers to these. And I think we could, you know, there's probably better things to, to do. No, that sounds great. I mean, I, I think it's interesting that there was some sort of uh, uh, maybe a mixture of uh, convolution and permutation learned there. Um, yeah. Amy, uh, we had a great talk a couple of weeks ago from uh, Sarah Hooker about the hardware lottery and how that, that kind of affects, you know, which architectures are popular these days. Um, one of the things I was thinking as I was watching your talk was that uh, it seems like there's a lot of those effects there. So both, you know, which architectures are efficient to run on GPU, um, yep. but also these days, which architectures have massive amounts of pre-training, um, yep. you know, uh, like you said, PyTorch chips with, you know, architectures pre-trained on ImageNet. I think you mentioned right. transformers and how, right. how much pre-training they, they've seen. Do you have any thoughts on how those things interplay with like, uh, you know, some architectures might just, you know, have better initializations because they've been through. Yeah, and I, I think that's, I think that's a good question. I think it's kind of related to what we were just talking about, which is I think one way to, I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, for transformers, a lot of it is self-supervised, right? You can use unsupervised learning to train on huge, you still need a huge amount of compute but we often have massive amounts of unsupervised data. Could you do that same sort of thing to learn the XD or to warm start the XD operations? Exactly how to do that, I don't know. But could you use unsupervised data or you know, meta learning or whatever else to learn, spend, spend a fair bit of time on a new domain to learn the operations in a better way and then fine tune it on your actual data or, or you know, train both the, the um, the operate the model parameters and the the model weights on your actual data. So I, I think that you know I think that is something that I'm super interested in exploring. We haven't done that yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, if throwing a lot of data at a problem is is going to be useful, and unsupervised data is more plentiful. I mean, the the counter argument to all of that is that in a new domain that people haven't looked at a lot, maybe there just isn't a lot of data. Period. And if that's the case, then everything I'm saying won't really make sense. And then there's a question right. though of how close is that domain to the small number of pre-trained models where we've already thrown a massive amount of data on it. And I guess my argument is that I'm not saying that we should not we should just dogmatically not use what we've already learned. I'm just saying that right now we kind of dogmatically only do that when it's not the right thing to do in some cases, right? If, you're, if, if your problem looks enough like an image problem, or enough like a problem where a transformer is good, great, take advantage of what, what is freely available, don't reinvent the wheel. But the PDE example is an example where that just didn't work. And my, my, my bet is that there's more of those applications coming as people, you know, more and more people are starting to, to look at this sort of stuff. Right, yeah. I think you had waste management on the, on the glacier. Yeah. Well, so that's one, one, of our, one of our customers at Determine does waste management. So that's, the, that's a, it's a real application that I know about, yeah. Wow, nice. Hey, I mean, so this ties to a question I had, which is you, you also spend some time in industry. So how, um, you know, how, what, what would you say is the adoption of neural architecture search? Where are people in terms of adopting it? And maybe also of auto ML in general, if you can say anything. Yeah, about yeah. so I think that, uh, I think it's mixed. I mean, on, on one hand, on one end, even in, even in research, right? There was a poll at NeurIPS, I think not this year, but last year about whether, you know, so I view, I view neural architecture search as a specialized subproblem of hyperparameter search. And hyperparameter search is not as new of a problem. It's not sexy, right? It's been around for a while at this point, but it's also known, and granted I, I've, I'm biased here. I've done a lot of work in that in the past, but it's known that, you know, hyperparameter tuning can be helpful and that grant, grid, grid or random search while simple and reasonable, there are better methods that you can use. And, you know, there, there was a poll at NeurIPS last year about researchers who you would imagine are pretty, you know, 
at the cutting edge in terms of what, what is available, what they can use. And many researchers either don't do any hyperparameter tuning or just use greater random search due to the fact that it's just hard to use it. It's, uh, these other things aren't accessible, maybe not conceptually, but there's, there isn't good software for it. It's, you know, the, the algorithm that, you know, my group came up with a while ago is hyperband, right? And if you use it the right way, it works really well. It's really robust, but it, like any method that's more, it's more complicated than just vanilla random search. And there are hyper, hyper parameters that you have to set. You also, from a systems perspective, have to figure out how to train a bunch of models for a little bit, pause them, mm -hmm. capture all of their intermediate state, restart them, and do that efficiently. Otherwise, you're not going to get any speed up benefits. And as a researcher, you don't want to deal with that. And so to answer your question, Matei, I think that I don't think people, I think people are using them not as much as you might expect. And I think the biggest issue at this point, though, is in some sense less the algorithms. It's not, oh, well, I, you know, hyperman is there, but this other method isn't, or vice versa. It's it's how do I like, it's just, you know, I mean, I think Spark is similar, right? Like, and I, I think I probably learned this from you. Spark was good for a lot of reasons, but one reason it was really good was that it was just a lot easier to use, right? Making something that people can actually use and digest, and it's just, it's like the interfaces yeah, make sense, the APIs make sense. People aren't going to use these things otherwise because there's a there's a barrier to entry. And I think that the the barrier to entry from a systems point of view and an API point of view for hyperparameter tuning is still too high. And that I think is a, is a big obstacle for people using it. And I, then I think neural architecture search is, you know, is a niche part of, um, is a niche part of hyperparameter optimization. And so people are using it even less. I would say though, the one, I mean, everything I've talked about is neural architecture search focused on accuracy. And there, I, I don't see people using it all that much. And I would argue that it's not maybe the best use of, I mean, it, it could be useful, but it's, you, you wanna use it at the very end of your process. But there is also neural architecture search in these constrained environments. And I think that is a really interesting area. And at least a lot of big organizations are using that already and have come up with new methods that you know, can compress on the fly while they're training. Um, and I think that is actually something, if not in a widespread fashion, there are some clear examples of it actually being useful in practice. So that was a long answer, hopefully. Oh, it makes sense, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, I actually had, you know, I think for a you know, complete review on the, you know, um, uh, how easy is it to do, uh, even, even have a parameter search, I can tell you like we are working on it. There, there's something, for instance, in, in Ludwig, there's something that's going in that direction, which I yeah. will be happy to, to chat about later. Yeah. I actually have a question uh, that is related to the, um, so one, one consideration that I'm curious to get your, feed, to your, your thoughts on is you were talking about, you know, what would mean to do um, um, transfer learning and you know, learning from unstructured, from unsupervised data for, uh, for XD operations. Um, I think that there is an additional dimension there, which is interesting, which is, well, the XD dimensions actually has three matrices, right? The K, L, and M, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. the naming scheme. Mm -hmm. um, it could be interesting to see if maybe K transfers, but L and M don't transfer, right. or the weights transfer, or the architecture doesn't transfer. Right. What, did you, what are your thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, so I guess uh, I have a, it's not quite answering your question, but it is, it's a question that we thought about a lot, which is, right, the, and I think it's sort of related, um, but when we started thinking about this, right, the, these kaleidoscope matrices exist, and in some sense, the XD operations are no more expressive than K matrices themselves. So there's a question of why not just use a single K matrix? Why go through all this effort of using three K matrices in the way that we're using them? Go, like, why not just replace a, you know, why not just use a K matrix directly? And that is, I think, related to the, the question that you asked in the sense that there's kind of two reasons. One is an efficiency reason. If you have, if you have multi, multi-dimensional input, it's, it's just representationally more efficient to do what we're doing rather than just use a K-matrix on its own. But to this other point, and this is what's related to you, what you were saying is, I didn't talk about this at all, but the way we add an inductive bias with the XD operations, which is that we assume that, and this is similar to what people do with neural networks right now, which is that at each layer, right, you have multiple channels, right? You have multiple channels. We fix the architecture parameters to be fixed across channels. Different weights, but different, but different, uh, but the same K matrices, uh, the, the same uh, architecture matrices. 
If you just use a single K matrix to do this, you'd be conflating the model weights with the architecture weights, and you wouldn't be able to introduce that inductive bias. And we found that that actually really matters. So there could then also be other inductive biases you want to use in terms of which of these KLNM you want to meta-learn and transfer and which ones you want to learn from scratch. We haven't done any of that, but we have seen that fixing them across channels in a layer does seem to work well. So the point is, I think it's a, it's a good question. We, that's, that's how far we've taken it, but we've seen that at least in that, from that point of view, it does seem to be beneficial. And it's a really good justification to do what we're doing versus just using a K matrix on its own. Right, right, right. No, this makes a lot of sense. And actually I have a little follow up on this is um, another aspect of um, the, the original, uh, if I remember correctly, the original kaleidoscope paper, those matrices were like binary matrices with um, very, very sparse binary matrices, right? Um, I don't think that the matrices that you are training are actually either binary because again, it would be difficult to, to optimize for them um, or, um, or there's any sparsity um, that you're specifically you know, penalizing for, 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 um, for density or something like that. Uh, maybe that could be you know, an interesting thing to try and do because there could also be a, a way for speeding up things because once you have, if, if, your, if your K matrix is, is sparse, then maybe you can transform that that operation in a like, compile that operation into something that is more efficient, right? Yeah, I mean that, that's interesting. That's that that's a question for a tree. <laughs> that's that's where he's been, yeah, he's been super helpful there. But yeah, I mean generally that is the that is what we're coming to right now though, where like it's efficient enough that it's reasonable, but we like at, asymptotic efficiency and actual efficiency are not the same, and we're definitely slower than vanilla convolutional matrices and you know where I think that there's two factors there one of them is that fundamentally we are doing more the, the constants should be bigger for what we're doing because it's more expressive but I think it is also the case that tree is amazing but there's also decades of software for comp, you know for these other things whereas there's just tree right now for so there is just there's software that can get improved I think um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and yeah and 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 you know I think what he's done already is pretty amazing to get it to the point where it's actually already usable. But I would imagine that there's further further juice there to, to optimize. Uh, Amit, I have a question about, you know, what these XD networks end up looking like once they're trained. Um, if you train, you know, 10 different networks, are they gonna converge to the same roughly looking architecture or does it look different every time? Huh, that is, a, I, to be I mean, we, our experiments, the results are, you know, reported over multiple trials to make sure that the accuracy is reasonable. I have not, I, I just don't have an, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question and just understanding more, if we're doing something different and we're saying that it's, we're learning new operations, getting a better handle on what those operations are and what things look like, it would be useful. I, I don't have a good answer to that. The best answer I have is a repeat of what I said before, which is that according to this one metric, we know that, you know, things differ, at least in this one setup but we haven't done a thorough analysis of, of, uh, of what you asked. I think it's a good question. And I have a follow-up question that this is mostly from an audience member, Johan Hauswald uh, asked about kind of the performance difference um, in terms of the, perhaps the model size or memory footprint compared to like a CNN and an XD network. Yeah, so let's see, I think I, yeah, so, okay. So I have this written down. So XD operations and a ResNet 20 backbone, they, they're, they're what, they're like eight, the forward pass is eight times slower and the number of parameters is like six X more. So it's within an order of magnitude, but it is, it's clearly, it's clearly uh, bigger. The so one thing I would say though, that, that, that's, that's compared to, again, I, I'm wary of making too many comparisons just to neural architecture search because I don't think that we're solving exactly the same problem. But, but I would say that on one hand, you know, we're, we're five to 10 X bigger uh, than these very small, the small networks that we're looking at. We're also though smaller than the NOS networks that we get comparable performance on, on the data sets that, on the, on the vision data sets that we're using. So, so, so have, you, have you thought at all about uh, maybe pruning the network after you've trained it? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, I think a little bit we have, no, not, I mean, the, it's a good question. The, the general question of how to, how to make them exactly the same size is, 
is a reasonable, I, yeah, but I, we have not thought seriously yet about how to do it. This is, I mean, I, yeah, the, the broad question of how to, how to make it faster and smaller is one that we are thinking about. Specific directions to actually execute on that are still open though. Yeah, it sounds like there's like tons of opportunities there. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. And the point is those are results having done nothing, like we, we've done literally nothing yet to try to fix that. This is pretty early work. Hey, Meet, as, uh, as we get uh, closer to the end of the hour, I was wondering if we could get some hot takes on transformers. Um, there's been a lot of hype about them recently. I think, uh, you know, in the past few days, there was a, a new like image net Soto with transformers, uh, a couple weeks to some, you know, n months in the past, there was a paper pre-trained transformers as universal computation engines. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on, uh, the, the, the current, you know, excitement around transformers thoughts on transformers in general. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I learned a new, uh, I knew, I learned a new word, which it, maybe it's embarrassing, like Bertology, which is like the study of, you know, the science of, of what Bert is doing. No, I mean, I think, it, I think it's cool. They, they're, they're, I, I'm not an expert on Bertology, given that I didn't know that the word existed up until a few days ago. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I see the hype firsthand and people are trying to understand how these, what these models do, how they work. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, there, there is, I have one student who is working on something that I think is interesting in terms of uh, trying to figure out for trans, I guess, yeah, he's mostly focusing on transformers just because that's what everyone's doing right now. But this idea of the schedule of pre-training versus, you know, trend, uh, of adapting to new tasks. And I think he has, um, it's not quite a hot take yet because I don't think he's ready to talk about the results. So I won't either, but I think we have, some soon to come hot takes in terms of the, basically a follow-up on the don't, you know, don't stop pre-training paper. We, we have slightly different conclusions than I think than what, what, what those guys say. Um, but yeah, no, I, beyond saying that I, I, I'm feeling exactly the same thing that you mentioned. I don't, I don't have any other hot takes to say about it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe we can have you back on when, when, when that paper goes out yeah. uh, to get that hot take in. Um, yeah, since we're pretty much at the end of the hour, I, I want to thank you, Meet, for taking time out. And uh, yeah, I just want to plug again that um, next week is the MLSS conference. So uh, register and join. And, and yeah, I think it's April. Uh, what it's is Monday it? through Friday. The main conference is Tuesday through Thursday. There is a, a, chip comp or a chip symposium or something on Monday. And then there's some really great workshops on Friday. Yeah, yeah so that's all we very relevant to our audience. Um, yeah. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in and go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu, join the mailing list um, if you want to keep getting emails about great talks and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, next week, we're going to have Lin Ma talking about self-driving database management systems. So thanks, everyone. See ya. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.